begin in Rwanda, where a memorial is due to be held to mark 30 years since the 1994 genocide. In just 100 days, Hutu militias killed more than 800,000 people, mostly from the ethnic Tutsi minority as well as Hutu moderates. It was triggered by the assassination of the Hutu president, Juvenal Habarimana. Hutus accused Tutsi rebels from the Rwandan Patriotic Front of shooting down his plane. The group denied involvement. Between April and July, Hutu militias and elements within the Rwandan army slaughtered Tutsis and political opponents. The killings finally stopped on July the 4th when the Rwandan Patriotic Front, backed by the Ugandan army, captured the capital. Kigali. Nizirie, Johanna's mother, was a Tutsi and his father was a Hutu. He was 30 years old when he says Hutu forces made him kill Tutsis. Nizirie was jailed for 15 years by grassroots courts formed to serve justice in local communities after the genocide. Here's his story in his own words and a warning it contains some distressing images. <laughs> Babandi <laughs> Yet, <laughs> Joining us now on Al Jazeera is Mireille Abewi, who's a Rwandan genocide survivor. Her father was one of the first victims. She is live from Edmonton in Canada. Uh, Mireille, thank you so much for joining us on Al Jazeera. You were just 12 years old when the genocide started, and your father, as we mentioned, was one of the first victims on April 7th. What is your most vivid memory of that day, and how do you feel today? Oh, thank you so much for asking. Um, obviously, it has been 30 years uh, since uh, that day. And uh, when I look at the time right now, it was uh, around this time in Rwanda when my dad was taken away. My dad was um, only 42 years old, the same age that I am today. And uh, so today came as a very important... Uh, I tell my kids all the time that... Uh, I really thank God to have made it 42 years old, especially having a dad who was out there. He was a professional soccer player. He was young. He was full of life, and he was taken on that day. Uh, the memory that I remember most is how my dad used to wear a towel around his waist. And um, that day, he had his socks on, and uh, he had uh, slippers that we call umoja which I don't understand how people put on socks and put on those. And I remember that day when they were coming and asking everyone at home who was uh, 18 years and over, because they were the ones who had the identity card. And uh, 
I did not think that would be the day that um, I will no longer see my dad. Mm. And uh, that day until today has, has always been difficult. But again, it has been 30 years old. There are so many other things that happened within those three months that really hit more than uh, the day that my dad passed away. Were they, and uh, I have... Were, were there any yes, signs, please. were there any signs at all of what was to come? There were signs. My dad um, had been beat so many times. My dad was not born in Rwanda. He was born in Burundi. So there was almost something on his head that he was a Tutsi, other than his looks, of course. And uh, because of that, he was beat so many times simply because he was a Tutsi. And um, when, uh, so in February of that year, there had been a person that was killed and when he was a Hutu, that they say that he was killed by the RPF at the time, his name was Wichana. So when Wichana was killed, they came to my house and they were calling my dad mm. a cockroach and they beat him up. So he knew right away when that plan had, when the Habyarimana plan, um, when, when Habyarimana lost his life, he knew right away when everybody was, uh, was being happy celebrating, the Tutsis celebrating that Habyarimana was dead, my dad was like, uh, no, stop celebrating because they're coming for us. I mm. remember that morning, that same morning, him telling uh, everybody that, hey, they're coming for us. The, and it is true that on that same day is the day that he was killed. The, the, what happened, as you said, um, the, the following three months was, was just unimaginable. We saw the pictures, we heard the stories. But was there a moment of hope for you that you witnessed during those dark days of the genocide? Unfortunately not. There was no day of hope um, until uh, the day that I remember. We, I was born and raised in Kigali, and we left Kigali to go to Gitarama in a place called Kabgai, and that's where the RPF founders. Uh, I don't even recall the days. I'll, I don't think I know the dates, but I remember because in the stories that we were told, we knew what they were. They were boots. Their um, military was was different right. from what uh, Rwanda at the time were, was wearing. So I remember when I saw them, even though I was 12 years old, I knew who they were, and I started smiling. I knew that the saviors, again, what I thought were the saviors, were there at the time. Hmm. And that is the only moment of hope that I had in those three months. Mireille, when you hear from perpetrators like Nizirie, whom we just heard in, in our report, who are so remorseful and, and so broken by, by their experience of being on the perpetrator's side, do you forgive? Yes. Uh, my journey of forgiveness started way too early. And I don't know if many Rwandans have followed the teaching of two men. One was called Neo Mugabo and the other one was called Kizito Mihigo. Those two men have taught me what real reconciliation is. So I just heard about that man and I thought about these 30 years. If we listen to those two men who were as young as I was at the time, those two men were also 12 years old. They were also born in 1981 like me. So the forgiveness and reconciliation that they were teaching is way better than what Rwanda is going through. So what Rwanda goes through, it's almost like forceful. It's almost like politic. It has nothing to do with uh, us, the survivors, reuniting and also thinking. In the teaching of that Neo Mugawo, he was asking, would you rather have a dad like mine who lost his life, or would you rather have a dad who's in prison? And I remember myself asking myself, how do those kids feel right now? Those kids that when we, are, uh, when we haven't taken that journey of forgiveness, there's a way that even right now that Rwanda does not have ethnic groups, as they say, mm. but there's a way that we treat the men and the women who are in those uh, groups that are the Hutus, the Tutsus. And I wonder if we had taken right. that path of forgiveness that Neo Mugawo and Kizito talked about, sang about in their song, where would we really be? So 
to answer the question that you asked, I have forgiven 100%. And I wish that um, there were many people in Rwanda that could really teach about forgiveness okay. instead of taking uh, the genocide as just a politicized event. Mireille, thank you so much for talking to us and sharing your experience with us. Mireille Abewe, a Rwandan genocide survivor, joining us there from Edmonton, Canada. Thank you so much. Thank you.